Good morning, everyone. I'm Nicolas Sardodi, the organizer of the mini conference on open source, multi core, and parallel computing. It's a real, real pleasure to be all together here. This is a, an effort on something that I strongly believe that New Zealand and Australia has an uh, interesting opportunity to become a hub on this convergence between open source and parallel computing. And that's the spirit of all of us gathering here, particularly the speakers that I want to uh, acknowledge, some of them coming from foreign countries like Germany, Australia, United States, and the South Island, so <laughs> which I belong to. So uh, I think that the aim of this mini-conf is to create a small brotherhood around these topics. And I won't bother you more about this. All of you have the program. And um, please welcome Lenz, uh, the first presenter. Mm, we will have, all of us have the timetable. All of us have hours on our computers. So in my previous life, I've been a math teacher. So I can be extremely direct on telling you, please stop <laughs> and disconnect the mic. We definitely expect to be interactive. All the mini conference says exactly the same. But uh, honestly, the objective is to learn from each other and know each other. So there are no rewards for getting the, the card here or there. It's a uh, mangle and try to things, try to make things happen. I am just, there are a lot of seats in the front and uh, on you. Thank you very much. Man, <laughs> that uh, I would appreciate if someone expect to uh, have the question recorded needs to use a mic. So it's cool to make questions, interruptions, but if you want to mother to hear what you say, you need to use a microphone. Okay. I can also simply uh, repeat, repeat the, the question. Questions. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, um, you can hear me, I think, it's uh, loud enough, okay. Um, I'm Lent, uh, I'll talk about parallel programming and um, yeah, how I actually came about it. Um, in particular, from a web development point of view, no front end stuff, I'm talking about the real stuff that's happening behind beautiful web pages. Um, I'm German, I live in New Zealand for like the last couple of years now. Um, I love it down here, several reasons why I left Germany. Um, one of them, if I would think to be in snow now, somewhere up in the mountains, I would hate it, I think. <laughs> it's just a beautiful country. Um, I'm a text editor, addict, since I'm able to write, uh, used my my various uh, computers, not really for gaming, more for uh, doing useful stuff for them. Um, I started um, my work life with about 19 when I started my first company. I started leading people with about 21-ish. Um, so I've done a lot of stuff in Europe. I quit everything, came to New Zealand. I'm CTO of a small startup called ID Trio in the moment. And I run something that is uh, more relevant for today. I run the U-Launch in Wellington, which is the Erling User Group. I'll shortly drop some words about the Erling User Group because uh, I think it's one of those rare gatherings of strange people in Wellington um, that actually care about parallel programming in general. We are not only about Erling. We are about parallel programming. We are about um, geeks that love to play with stuff that is not mainstream. And um, we're a good crowd, and we meet once a month, and everyone is welcome to come around. We are normally at Catalyst IT, uh, level three, once a month. There is a mailing list um, on, on Google. So feel free to come around. You'll find us somewhere. We're launch Wellington. Just Google for it, you'll find it. Um, as I said, I'm not one of those web guys who really do front-end stuff. Um, I'll talk about message passing infrastructures today. I'll obviously talk about Erlang today. 
and I talk a bit about open standards and why I learned the hard way that they matter. Um, those three topics are, are really essential to, to what I do in a moment, which is uh, web stuff again. <laughs> but I'll, I'll come to that in a minute. I started... Um, I started working on internet infrastructures back in the late 90s. And so I've seen the dot-com bubble, bubble come up and burst, and I've seen the Web 2.0 bubble come and kind of still hanging around, bursting every now and then. Um, one of the things that I've seen again and again is you have a small project, lives on a server, you try to scale it, and then you run into some problems. But you have to scale it because it can, became popular or whatever, and, and people love it. And, and all the things that happen from there on are actually uh, a theme that I've done so often. And I've seen a lot of people doing it every, every so often as well. You, you have one server. You, you try to separate out functionality because one server's breaking down. You can put a stronger server to the problem. but Somewhere and you, you hit a dead end, so you have to separate functionality. You normally separate out the web server from the database server, so you have two servers. You can kind of work with that setup for a while, then you have to separate out more functionality. But it's, it's not really going anywhere because somewhere you're just hitting a dead end. So you start to load balance. You have more servers. You have like five front end servers and load balance in front, and everything works fine until you hit the next bad, dead end because. Your database doesn't scale anymore. You need a bigger database server. You start to separate out your database server into a reading database cluster and one writing master and all those kind of setups. And we've seen them a lot in, in various setups. And it really, it really all um, kind of is a recurring theme if you look into startups that try to scale. Somewhere they hit exactly this point. And the load balancing thing is an interesting one because if we look at um, if we look at the web server part, it's it's really easy to scale web servers. We've done that a dozen to uh, hundred of times. It's you can read it up on the internet. You're, there's really really straightforward load balances to configure. This is this is really easy stuff. Um, with databases, it's kind of harder because you have locks, you have information that is shared somewhere. You have you have some kind of some kind of one, one thing where everything tries to write to, and if you have two of them, it, it breaks stuff badly, normally. Um, talking about uh, relational databases here, I'll come to the other model in a, a bit later. Um, one, of, one of the problems is, is that we have some, some kind of shared, shared state that we try to maintain across several instances, which is always way harder than just a reading web server where we don't really bother about shared states. And then we have a final thing, which is business logic, which is often not really scalable at all, because we can't simply do several tasks in parallel, because they might actually depend on each other. They might, um, I, I probably have to wait for one computation actually to end in order to start something else. So business logic is from time to time simply a problem that cannot be run in parallel. So um, it is really hard to load balance because how will you load balance something that has to run sing, uh, in, a, in, a, in an iteration one after the other? And if we look more into the problem that we actually try to solve, we, have, we, we, we really try to solve a, a problem of shared state, of, of shared data. Um, a reading, a reading operation from, from several backends is always no problem. A writing operation to several backends is always a problem because this shared state, this shared information is, is, is exactly the thing where we hit the wall. Um, the problem with reading from multiple backends might be that the information that I'm reading might be old because we have database replication going on. We have probably some ugly rsync stuff going on that actually syncs data between servers and stuff like that. So the reading part might be a problem, but most of the time it is not, at least in web projects. Web projects are normally easy to handle. Um, 
the writing bit is, is the big problem. So in general terms, we have a problem of global locking. Global locks come in, come in all kind of different colors and, and, and shapes. And, and so you've, if, if you've never started or tried to actually parallelize um, a project or to run a project on more than one server, you normally don't really notice how many global locks you've actually in your code base. And once you've started to, to run a service on multiple servers, once you've started to run a backend process on, on multiple servers, once you've started to actually break down your code base into, into smaller pieces that you can run in parallel, you actually start to notice a lot of those. Um, if we look into parallel programming now, away from all that web stuff to a more um, scientific approach to programming, <laughs> we actually notice parallel programming is exactly about solving this problem about global locks. It's exactly about how I chuck up my code base into lots of small pieces that I can run in parallel that actually work and where I actually try to avoid this global locking. So the last time I, I wrote a, a larger infrastructure for, for running web, a web infrastructure or running a, a web-based project, um, I, I had a, a fairly large code base that was running nicely on a really, really big server at that time. And I actually hit that dead end. So I had to do something. I, I, I couldn't just throw a bigger server onto it. It was, it was one of those projects that grew out of one server and I was already at the stage where I had several separated out functionalities like different database server from the other backends and stuff like that. So I was at a point where I really had to take the code base apart and, and see how I can make it faster by, by writing something more parallel. Um, I had a, a lot of asynchronous processes in that thing. Um, I'm, I'm talking about domain, regist domain name registration. In that case, you have like this very, very odd mixture of very, very synchronous things, like calls that go from a couple of seconds to some 20, 30 seconds. And then you have a different, so like the, same uh, the, the same kind of call, but for a different um, domain or different, different backend service and can take for days, literally days, to come back. So you have a very diverse kind of, um, kind of infra infrastructure you have to, to deal with, but you have to unify it in a way that you can abstract it enough to, to have in the back a system that actually has one view to the whole thing. So this, this was the challenge I, I tried to solve. And what I, what I came up with was a, a small very, very easy curl based environment that actually um, had its own message queue. It had its own messaging format. It was a binary protocol. It was fast. It was nice. It was um, playing well for what I, I needed it. And it had um, a lot of, um, at that time for me, interesting concepts that uh, worked really well and um, that uh, were interesting to write and to implement because it was the first time I actually started to um, take my whole software apart, remove all those global locks, or the most of them at least, and, and, and try to, to write um, a system that, uh, that, try, uh, that doesn't really rely on one data source or on one, one global thing, but instead took all the information and passed it along through a queue Wire, wire messages that are sent from one server to the other, to the other, to the other. So um, the, the end result was a cluster of servers that actually ran lots of small daemons that all knew a common message format and knew how to interact with that message format. And I just fired a, a message to that cluster, and that cluster kind of magically, based on your routing rules, of course, and, and some, some workflow logic, um, resolved this problem and then gave me back a response. And this was, this was all um, the, the first time I really tried to, to play with message-driven architecture. And it was 
in the beginning really hard for me to, to go away from this more traditional software development model where you have one monolithic thing where you actually write code in a, in, 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 a, in a way that you just write a couple of libraries, hook them together and compile one big thing. Um, and, and go with the completely different way to actually write a lot of daemons. Instead of writing a library, I actually wrote a daemon and that daemon had the functionality and um, wrapped, instead of wrapping it in, a, in one big global thing, I wrapped it into a small daemon framework that actually knew the messaging format and, and how to interact with, with uh, all the other daemons. And um, really chucked it up in lots of, lots of small, small bits and pieces. Um, the thing I learned from there is that message passing is easy once you've wrapped your head around it. Uh, the problem is to wrap your head around it in the first place, and it's, uh, it's an interesting ride. You start out with a, a couple of really big demons, and then you notice I could actually go f smaller and smaller and smaller, and I ended up with an with a ecosystem of probably 20 to 25 different demons for, for a fairly minor part of our backend infrastructure that all interacted in a really, really uh, nice way, and, and it, was, it was really fast. And when I, when I look back at it today, um, what I've actually written is a complete message passing infrastructure without actually knowing that I've done it in the first place. So I kind of sat down and tried to solve a problem and came to, to this conclusion, and um, from, from Looking back today, it was was a good approach, but um, it was a bit a bit simplistic in terms of uh, how message passing infrastructures could work. But um, it worked quite well. It did millions of transactions. It was fast. It was stable. Um, it was good enough to handle all the load I had at that time. I worked with that system for a while, and as geeks normally do, they can't keep your fingers calm, and I found something else called Erlang. Um, Erlang is a functional programming language uh, that has a couple of drastic approaches. Erlang um, tries to not share anything. It's a shared nothing language. At least that's what they say. It's not 100% true, but it is true enough. Um, it is really, really, really hard in Erlang to share state or to share information other than passing a message. It is really hard to share some kind of global information across different instances. What you really normally do is you send a message to that, to that, other, me uh, to that other process, and this message actually holds all the information the other process needs. This message can be a function. This message can be anything that you want to send. So you can actually send off a function from one process to another process to run that function and give back the result. Once you've wrapped your head around the really, really odd notation of Erlang, once you've got over, gotten over this uh, typical Unix step that you have when you start to learn something new that is uh, based out of the Unix environment where you have that odd thing and then you learn it and then everything is nice. Um, once, you've, once you're over that, that first step, Erlang is a, is a wonderful language. And uh, it lets you do a lot of things that are really, really, really hard to do in other languages. One of the things is um, you, you don't really need to think about processes. Because um, the Erlang VM abstracts processes away from the operating system. You don't have to thread, you don't have to fork, you don't have to do anything fancy. You simply create a process. You simply send a message. You don't bother if the message is sent actually within the same VM or across VMs on the same box or across, in fact, VMs running on different servers. The addressing is all more or less the same. It's if you address it just with a name or with a kind of user ha username, hostname kind of notation, it's, it's really, really simple to do message passing. And it's all in the VM. It's all there. 
Um, so Erlang was really like I found it. Um, I was I was absolutely excited. I wanted to rewrite everything in Erlang. Um, with things that look like heaven on earth, um, they might sometimes only look like it. So for for a while, I've been trying to rewrite everything in Erlang, and then I noticed that the stuff I actually had, and it was running, was not really compatible with how Erlang does th things. Like, I've done my own protocol, which worked really nice. It was fast and small and everything, small footprint on the wire. But it was not compatible with anything I had in Erlang, because it was some handcrafted binary thing that um, wasn't available in Erlang. I would have needed to write something, or some kind of compatibility layer, interfacing daemon, or whatever. So I started, I started to, to feel that pain that you feel when you've come up with something absolutely brilliant, and then you notice it was brilliant for a while, but now you hit the wall again. So it's like a lot of those scaling pro uh, problems that you have in, in internet infrastructures. You come up with that wonderful thing, and it works for exactly that long. And this was a moment where I was a bit, yeah, well, I left it aside. I thought, OK, Rulling is nice, but I can't really use it in the moment. I have an infrastructure that works. Um, it's working good enough. I, I can't really deal with it. So I started playing with a couple of other things instead. I started with CouchDB. I started playing with RabbitMQ. I already played a lot with uh, eChabody. eChabody is a, is a really nice Chabba daemon for those ones who've never played with instant messaging. This is one of those annoying things that pop up on your screen. Um, eChabody is uh, the Chabba daemon that runs most of the really, really large deployments. It's written in Erlang. Um, uh, no, Facebook chat's a bit different. I can probably go into that after the session. I give you some background about that. <laughs> it's written in Erlang, partly at least. Um, CouchDB is something we've been playing with for a while now, and we use it in production. It's a document database uh, that is um, a completely different approach to database um, usage. Um, it, is a, it is not a relational database. It has uh, a MapReduce uh, approach to a key value store, which is, it sounds really strange, but if, if you're interested in it, I'll go into more details. But um, the other thing that I played with is, is RabbitMQ, and RabbitMQ is a, is a message queue running AMQP. AMQP is an open messaging standard, and I, I didn't really know how to how to integrate it with my stack, but I, I was curious, and I, I played, and it was fast and funny, and, and um, kind of worked, and did a lot of uh, uh, those small tinkering projects that never led anywhere, but um, I felt that there is something about those projects, and they're all Erlang projects. They're all um, they're all open standards based, and um, when playing with them, I noticed something that I wasn't used to. Um, the, actually, the the memory footprint and the, the the CPU footprint that I got from those projects, even if I stressed them, was really really small compared to everything I had in my in my Perl environment or in even Boost in, in PHP based environments or, or Ruby environments or what some of those. The memory footprint was really small because normally if you try to scale a Perl project, you have 10, 20, 50, 100 Perl processes, each running a Perl interpreter. So, taking up a lot of a lot of your 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 CPU and memory um, for redundant information, basically, having a VM that abstracts away that interpreter thing um, gives you way more room. But without the overhead that you have in Java, where we have that one interpreter, but like objects, not small stuff. So, this is this was something that was really new for me because. So up to that point, for me, um, VM-driven languages were, were were always a bit like 
I always had that Java picture in mind that just blows up your memory and, and, and it's really hard to, to, to handle. Um, not from a deployment part of view, but from the, from the resource consumption point of view. And uh, then I looked at Erlang and I had a completely different view of, of, uh, of uh, VM-driven uh, languages again, because uh, it, was, it was really small and it was fast and it was, it was easy to handle. And as you can probably imagine, the more I played, the more I wished I could use them. <laughs> and um, this is what normally happens then. I bite the bullet, I sit down, I draft um, a new concept, and I, I try to come up with a, with a new, with a way to not throw away the entire code base I had already. But using this new stuff I wanted to use and do it, do it right this time. So one of the things I, I came up with was AMQP. AMQP is an is a, is a open messaging standard that has been around for a couple of years now. It's not yet version 1.0 in the specification, but it is already implemented by a couple of larger players. There are two major open source implementations, one from Apache, one from um, RabbitMQ. Um, and it's used by a couple of, of really large players in the industry. Um, so it's a, it's a safe it was a safe bet, I thought. It still is, I think. Um, the the Erlang implementation in, in, in special, they are, they, they've implemented a couple of, of nice features that are just coming up in some other Web 2.0 based projects like Pupup Subup interface or, or a couple of other really, really new stuff. Um, the the other thing I, I used was um, JSON. I didn't use XML. XML is something for NQP. They decided to go with XML. I tried to use something slim and small. Um, the reason why I used uh, JSON as a, as a transaction format instead of my former binary protocol that was way smaller on the wire is that what I gain by making a small footprint on the wire um, I lose in computing all those strange packages and I lose the flexibility of using whatever language I want to interface with. So by using an open format that has a standardized definition, I actually managed um, to port over my code and to start using Erlang. Erlang is, I already went into that kind of, it's, it's really small if I compare it to, to the stuff I used. Um, it has one interesting aspect for, especially today, it scales linear to about 32 cores in the moment, and they're still working on it to improve it further. Um, obviously, this number is marketing blurb. In reality, it looks a bit different, but what you get with Erlang really, really easy is you don't have to write a project for multi-core processing. Due to the nature of Erlang, every program that you write in Erlang, due to that message passing infrastructure nature, you just take that VM and say, here is a better box with more cores, and it uses it. And it gets a significant speed up from those cores without you changing a line of code. So this was a, a strong argument for me for, for Erlang because it meant that if I, if I need more power and I can't scale in boxes for some reasons, I can scale in CPUs and I get a similar or better um, speed up. And the distribution process is really, really easy. I have a beam file that I push just on a, on a, on a box and, and, it, and it runs. It's a bit like, like Java where you have a, a compiled char and you just throw it somewhere and, and it works. So I can, I can roll it out really easy. I still have Perl in the stack for compatibility, for string processing. Um, there is stuff that Perl is really good at. Um, why not use it? And this is exactly the point uh, I try to, to make with, with the reason why I went with a different, um, with a different stack. If I get a Python programmer <laughs> tomorrow that is really, really good at Python and does his stuff really, really good in Python, why should I force him to run Erlang or Perl? Let him write his stuff in Python and interface via trace and AMQP to our system and enhance our functionality just the way he does it. So I try to come up with a system that is really easy to to, to maintain and whichever 
language you come up with, and I'm sure we can somehow fiddle trace into it and somehow make AMQP work and uh, make sure we can actually use it. So if we look back, internet architectures, scaling to many servers, load balancing, reducing global logs. This is uh, the, the, the key things you're, you're, you're coming across every, every time. If we look actually at multi-core programming, it's not that different, I think. So I think we, we kind of try to solve similar problems there. So the internet infrastructure guys who learned the hard way that they can't scale with many servers just by throwing more servers at a problem. Um, I think we learn in multi-core processing the same kind of thing that if we just take our, our, our software and run it on more CPUs, it doesn't, doesn't really help. You have, to, you have to rethink your stuff. Good. That's me. This is where you can find me. Slide is not uh, yet on SlideShare, but it will be this afternoon. So the main way to recognize Mr. Lenz primary by ending on time, which is a fantastic example for everyone else. <laughs> Please join <laughs> hands. Um, we have time for questions. We definitely have time for questions. We have time. Uh, first of all, I want to recognize Chris. And you don't know and you can see him, but Chris is behind here dealing with the... <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> thanks, Chris. <laughs> so, um, we can take a few questions now, please. So the, pro uh, the, the question is about Gearman. Yeah. yeah, if Gearman tries to sell, I just repeat it for the, for the taping. So the question is if Gearman tries to solve a different, uh, the same problem. I think there are a lot of uh, projects that actually try to solve the same problem. And it really breaks down to personal preference which one you take. I love Erlang for the reasons I, I pointed out. And I think it's a, it's a really nice language to program in. But um, there, there are lots of projects that actually try to solve this problem. And good so. I mean. Only, only a, a fair competition under, under a lot of projects forces everyone to actually push it a bit further. <laughs> and the second question? Well, the question is if the um, string processing in Erlang is, uh, if, uh, why I use Perl for the string processing and not Erlang, and if the syntax of Erlang uh, needs to be cleaned up. I think um, this, the, the Erlang syntax is a, is, a, is a funny syntax once you've got used to it. And the problem is really that first step. Once you're over that first step, Erlang source code is really, really easy to, lead, to read and really, really understandable, I think. And actually, pretty pretty dense. You can write a, a fair amount of code in, in really not too many lines of code without obfuscating it. Very very different to Perl. Um, but <laughs> but the thing is, I'm Perl was written as a as a regex language basically. Perl was written for string processing. Why shouldn't I use it? The the whole point in in using open standards is that I can actually interact with my system with a language that makes sense, not with a language that I have to use because I've written the pro project in it. And this is, this is a big thing that I think has to happen, that you're not restricting yourself to a certain language, that you're not restricting your project or your entire infrastructure to a certain set of technology, but to make it open enough that you can actually interface with the stuff it, that makes sense and not with the stuff that is, I don't know, more okay. vogue. <laughs> well, if you don't know, you need to learn. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Yes. Um, if I <laughs> if I consider Google protocol buffers as a protocol instead of XML and JSON, 
Um, no, I didn't. For for a reason that I, if I if I look at the at the availability of of, of a protocol across a lot of languages, the smallest common denominator currently is XML and tracing. Tracing just came up as one of those things that is just available in about everything. XML is available in nearly everything. Um, on top of tracing, there is a lot of stuff that is emerging. Um, and I think that is really interesting. Um, I haven't used anything that is written on top of tracing yet, but I, I, I use tracing as, as, the base, as the base messaging, uh, messaging layer. Do we have other questions? I'm sure that Lance will be around. And in the meantime, we do the transfer from to the next speaker. I can probably go shortly on the Facebook chat thing. Mm -hmm. um, the Facebook chat infrastructure is not based on each ID. Um, the Facebook chat infrastructure, as far as I've understood it, is um, a set of um, Erlang web servers, uh, namely MojiWeb, that actually serves long calling um, comment, not really comment, but long calling um, HTTP uh, sessions to the to each browser that actually connects to it, and under that they have a messaging infrastructure that is partly based on Erlang and partly based on, I think C, but I'm not too sure about that. And they kind of push around messages and then serve them via Erlang to 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 the browser. Thank you very much, Lance. Thank you, okay? All right. For the ones that are enjoying the carpet in the back, there are at least 10 seats right in the front. And uh, I know that it's not the best place to be here, but there is a lot of space here. Um, I, want in the, I want to invite you also in the afternoon to the panels because also the questions relate to in an open way. So. We have 20 minutes of panel about who needs parallelism. I'm sure that Lance will join us, also James, Remo, and definitely it's not. Uh, I, I, I wrote, I prepared a, a panel and also a, a burst of a feather, but essentially it's it's a round table with everyone who wants to attend. So uh, I would be extremely interested to hear your thoughts and to discuss all together if this parallelism thing. It's really the new, new thing. So that's the title about would be. It's the software. Is the software parallel from, from here in the future? Would be all of us become parallel programmers? So I learned Fortran 25 years ago and forgot it 24 years ago. So it would be necessary for me to learn to program Fortran again. Uh, I strongly then invite you to the, to the birth of a feather. Again, now we have more empty seats, and uh, 